So we're out in Beanfield in North Dakota and we're going to do some root phenotyping. And so the first thing we do is go to the field and select the plants we want to sample. And so Kat is the one in charge and she's trained to come out, select some appropriate plants, mark them, and then Mike's going to dig them up. We're going to take them over, wash the, root, wash the soil off the roots, and then we'll score them. So the first step is sample identification. And what we're looking for are, in this case, we've decided to do four plants, okay. get samples of four plants. And we want four evenly spaced plants of more or less the same size and vigor. And so we want to avoid uh, double plantings. A lot of times you have two seeds fall into one hole, I guess because of the variation in seed size in this experiment. And let's do this right here. Let's do these four, Kat. Okay. So what we're doing here is poking the side of the stem, and that indicates the direction of where the neighbor is. Um, so you're, she's poking the side facing its closest in-row neighbor. Uh, in any case, they seem to avoid growing this way and explore more this way. And so that helps to explain some of the variation we see in root growth. Now we'll dig up the plants. Roughly a uh, shovel's width from the stem on each side. Loosen the soil on either side. Bundle the plants together with the tag, with the plot number on it. Put it in the wheelbarrow and take it over to the washing station. All right, so now we got the sample over at the washing station. We're gonna just swish them around in soapy water. The soap helps flocculate and disperse the clay particles, which is the toughest thing to get off to. But this soil comes off pretty easy. The more clay soils, you have to let them soak a little bit longer before the clay soil comes off. And there you go, that's pretty clean sample. And then we'll bring it over to the table to be scored. Um, and then we'll just snip the root from the stem. And usually we weigh the shoot biomass, but in this case there's so many we decided just to visually score the shoot biomass. So we'll unbundle our root sample, take apart the four samples here, and we try to pick the two most representative samples. A lot of times, maybe 20% of the time, you'll have a, a root something like this, only it is shaped more like a candy cane just because it was planted with a upside down orientation so we're not we don't want that kind of stuff we'll throw that out and opt for more of a symmetrical looking sample so that's a nice fairly symmetrical looking sample we'll use that one and either of these two would be acceptable but this is the smallest one of the bunch so we'll throw it and the funny shaped one out so when we're sampling the traits we're interested in are basal root whorl number basal root number, basal root growth angle, and that means the range, the low and the high number. We can measure tap diameter, we can measure adventitious diameter, basal root diameter, also branching density for all of those traits, all of those root classes, adventitious branching density, basal branching density, tap branching density. Sometimes we do these scores by quadrants. We give a score for disease, and we generally try to correlate this with shoot biomass, or in this case, we're looking at just shoot vigor, a visual evaluation of shoot vigor. Pick up the four samples and just try to gauge on a one to five scale with one being the best and five being poor growth. Uh, and also trying to estimate just total biomass, including pods what this plant would be. And this plant is looking somewhat average to poor. So we'll give it a score of a four. We'll just write down the plot identification 2049M. 
Uh, what did I, I gave it a four for the shoot score. And now the first trait I'll look for is BRWN, meaning basal root whorl number. That is the, um, the number of the number of sets of roots that a plant, a bean plant has. Not every plant has whorls. Um, maize does. Uh, soybean does not. Cowpea does not. Um, those are about all I've looked at, I guess. Up close, you can see that there's sets of basils here. One, two, one, two. Uh, one, two, and one, two. So that has two whorls. And each position is occupied with a healthy root, so that has eight basils in total. Maybe I should go back and explain the classes first. I'll set it down. So you have the spot where the seed initially germinated and the basils emerged from, right here. This is the radical, the primary root, that's the first root, root to emerge. Um, so here's, here's your primary root system, here's your basal root system, and then everything above the basils are adventitious roots. So these roots from that point up are adventitious roots. Um, and we usually, in common being, we usually consider that the basal roots constitute the framework of the root system. The primary root is always there. It always has a gravitropic response growing straight toward gravity. The adventitious roots are usually here, and they almost always grow horizontally, respect to gravity. But the basals can depending on the genotype and the conditions, they adjust from a deep, maybe something like 70 degrees to something shallow, even to zero, zero degrees being horizontal. And so the basils is where a lot of the variation and rooting depth uh, originates from. All right, so we've identified the basils, we've counted them, counted the number of whorls, and now we're gonna look at the approximate angles. And so we have this little protractor on a cutting board and we'll just put the point where the basils emerge from the hypocaudal in the center of the axis and look at where the roots are crossing this 10 centimeter arc. And in this case, we're running a range from about 20 to 40. And it's a good idea to rotate the root and also to look for the little point where Cat poked it. I think it's right here. I think it's right there. And you often see that there's a certain amount of two-dimensionality to a root system. This isn't the most obvious example. Maybe we can find another one to demonstrate this, but a lot of times you'll see, in this case, this plane is more developed than this plane. And that's associated with the dot, meaning that the roots were growing like this, as opposed to like this, where they would be competing with each, with each other more intensively. So for whatever reason, they seem to avoid competition with each other. And even in this case, this root started growing towards the other and then seemed to have curved off into the alleyway, into the less, com less intensively competitive area. So that's just an observation and something to be uh, careful of. Oh, here's a good... Angela gave me a good example of a nice two-dimensional bean plant. So here you see a, a plain... That's how they were probably growing, as opposed to like this, where that would be aggravating the competition. So they seem to develop differenti differentially, the basils and these bean plants. And I see this in almost all plots, so I think it's fairly ubiquitous. Okay, so we gave this a, an angle score of 2040, which is pretty middle of the road, pretty average. Now we'll measure the diameter of the taproot as an indication of its rooting depth. We're assuming that a larger diameter root is going to go down deeper, and we're interested in that for, for drought. A root that can get deeper can get water that's unavailable in surface soil layers. And so if the assumption holds that a larger diameter roots can get more water and conduct more water, we have something. So tap diameter of 1.5 millimeters, oh, no, centimeters, I'm sorry, millimeters is middle of the road. You get something, the largest is between maybe three millimeters is some of the largest and the sickest, most undeveloped roots are below one millimeter and that's basically not functional. Um, 
So another trait we're interested in for this study is the number of adventitious roots. And so that's we basically just count the number of roots that are alive and seem to be functional. So I just mark the stem with my finger now so I don't double count and just count the number of alive roots. One, two. Uh, I wouldn't count that one because it seems to be brown and dead and not doing anything anymore. Three. Um, four, which is pretty low. Uh, next trait is basal branching density. That means the number of laterals in a given segment on a basal root. So we pick a basal root. Show it over here. Pick a basal root, spread out the laterals a little bit, and then just count the number of laterals in a two centimeter segment, which is indicated right there. And you just count them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like it has 11, which is pretty average. Sometimes you get something up to 15, maybe even 18. Um, I haven't seen any of those in this population. You see some of that in Andean populations seem to have greater branching density. Um, then we give it a score for disease. Obviously we're talking about root disease here. Um, we've seen, um, well this is a good example, I'm not sure exactly what this is. I think that's an insect damage that was subsequently infected by a bacteria. We've seen Fusarium out here. Um, some, what would you call it, black rot. And there's a root rot dying from the tip here. Um, cold, wet conditions are make disease, or what would you call that, promote the growth of certain types of disease and that we're seeing those here. So for this, uh, for this experiment, this root is about average, really, slightly below average. So we'll give it a, we'll give it a six considering that it has this large scar, but most of the roots are white and healthy looking. Most of the tips are okay. So we'll give it a six. Something like that. And then quadrant one and, two, one and three, you would arrange so that that was the in-row neighbor. And then you would arrange, put the plant with its orientation in row based upon the, the poke you gave it. And you, then you could observe where the roots were growing. If they were growing more into quadrant one and three, meaning towards their neighbors, or more to quadrants two and four, meaning away, away from their neighbors. And then I would quantify the number of roots in there, the angles of roots in each quadrant, and the diameter of roots in each quadrant. And with that, I was able to tell that it does seem like um, the neighbors in row, those roots are steeper, have short, there are smaller diameter um, and sometimes they even curve like this root is doing away and like they're trying to avoid competition. I don't know if that's really the case, but that's my speculation, my hypothesis.